Welcome to the beautiful Wassa Community Church where we had our service this morning and where I forgot to click the record button before going up to the pulpit. Uh, but luckily someone did click the record button, so by the time we get into the scripture reading, <laughs> um, <laughs> there is some footage from this morning, uh, the whole sermon really. Uh, I'm just going to introduce you to the sermon, which is called The Saving Serpent. The saving serpent. Now, I asked my congregation this this morning, and I'll ask you as well, what is the saving serpent? What is the saving serpent? Now, some people might just say Jesus, and, you know, it represents Jesus, but it's not exactly Jesus. The saving serpent is actually something that we find in the book of Numbers. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Numbers 21, 4 to 9, and we will look at it the story of the bronze serpent. Now today is Palm Sunday. It's when we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus, Jesus' public declaration that he is the Messiah that everyone's been waiting for, for for so long. He's entering the city of Jerusalem where they will eventually sentence him to death, to crucifixion. And since we don't have a Good Friday service at this church, and we won't have one this week, we're actually going to be focusing on the death of Jesus for this sermon. What happens the week of his triumphal entry later on in the week, right? Probably Friday. So if that's what I'm talking about, why am I going to one of the old law books of the Bible? You know, about 1,400 years before Jesus even was... Uh, around in the flesh on the earth, you know, before the incarnation. Well, throughout the entire Bible, you find Jesus. You know, he's not just in the New Testament. He's in the Old. He's not only there in the beginning, since he is God. Jesus is God. He was there in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let us make man in our image. You know, you have that. It's the Trinity and stuff. But even throughout, like, he's there. One of the most amazing evidences showing that the Bible is truly a prophetic book and therefore there is incredible backing to take it as God's word is that Isaiah gives us such a detailed account of Jesus's death, his crucifixion, that it used to be common to claim that Christians just kind of wrote that, inserted it into the Bible as this Isaiah 53 chapter that wasn't there before. But one of the cool things is that the Dead Sea Scrolls, when we found those, they had the Great Isaiah Scroll, which was dated to being around 100 years before Jesus came to the earth, before Jesus' life in the flesh. And with that dating, that scroll that was dated that far back, guess what was there? It was Isaiah 53. And so it's just like, Amazing to see the proof there that not only do we have what's right in the Bible, but it also points prophetically to Jesus. And there's so many more prophecies as well as we look through Scripture. But it's not always in direct prophecy that we see Jesus. We see him all over. Sometimes there are actual appearances by him, what's called Christophanies. You know, the fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or maybe when he comes and visits uh, Abraham's tent, or possibly when it mentions the angel of the Lord. There's good evidence that that probably would be talking about Jesus, at least in most cases when it says the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, at least the, the person of the Godhead that is the Son, right? So there's a lot there with prophecy. There's a lot there with uh, Christophanies as well. Uh, probably a lot, there's a lot less Christophanies than prophecies for sure, but there's also something called types. There's these uh, foreshadowings in, let's say, the stories of Scripture itself. It's like things God uses to symbolize what's to come. So like all the law, like the whole sacrificial system itself, that's a foreshadowing. That's a type of the ultimate sacrifice that is to come in Christ, right? When Moses strikes the rock and water pours forth, that is also a type, a picture of the rock representing Jesus that gives living water. And you can go on and on, right? 
Today, we're looking at a different story from Moses, like I said, the story of the bronze serpent. And I'm sure you can figure out how it represents Jesus when we read through it, how it is a, you know, a type, a, a foreshadowing of Jesus. But what we're going to do is I'm going to go to the video where we're reading that together. Again, Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. Let's do it. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Lord, as we enter this time uh, reflecting on how this relates to you and just showing um, this in your word and just going through your word, I just pray that you would be with each one of us, Lord. Give us understanding of your truths in the name of Jesus. If I say anything that might be wrong or untrue, I pray that that would not be believed in the name of Jesus. I don't want to lead anyone astray. But again, for the things that are true, for the things that, are, um, that you want to get across as well, help those things to be remembered. Help those things to be understood. Help those things to be believed in the name of Jesus. Be at work in each one of our hearts, challenging us where we might need to be challenged and also encouraging us where we might need to be encouraged. Be again with me up here as I speak. Help me to speak clearly. Help me to see my notes well. Um, And just give me energy for uh, going through your word as well uh, in this time. I just thank you so much for your goodness, Lord. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus. And of course, in everything, in this and in all things, I just pray as well that you would be glorified. In the name of Jesus, amen. Who's really behind it all? Who's the orchestrator of all things? I think we too often forget God in our lives. Like if we're asked that question, we'll say God, right? But when it's our daily lives, how often do we forget God in our lives? We often mention here that God's at work in the big things and in the small things as well. And it's mentioned how we should, you know, take time to remember even those small things, even the little things. But how often during the week do we actually do that? You know, how often do we attribute those little things to the Lord? Because he's at work all the time. Also, how often do we complain? It's pretty bad living in such a, a rich society And still complaining about everything. Like, are there still problems here? Are there still things that we need to, you know, talk about, tell others about? Are there still things that we need to, you know, pray about? Are there things that we need to mourn, to shed tears about? Are there things we need to act on, stand up for? Are there, you know, times to actually make complaints, as in expressing our dissatisfaction? Of course there are. But first off... We have to do so respectfully and also not in a a whiny way at all. And secondly, we should not be complaining about so many of the little things that we tend to complain about probably 90% of the time or even more than that, maybe. I remember someone in Superstore kicking up a fuss at the vehicle insurance window because she had to go to the specific insurance window that was not at Superstore. It was actually over in Walmart. And I was like, it's Walmart, though, right? Like, it's Walmart, you know, right across the parking lot. And, and for us who have been to bigger cities, we know that the Cranbrook parking lot is not a very big parking lot. 
I'm sure we have our own stories about seeing people complain about things that are so little, you know, maybe the, maybe the Amazon package is supposed to come in two days and instead it comes in three days and it's like, what? You know, I was expecting this to be a two day delivery and that's a complaint. It's like, what is that, right? Or, or maybe they go to the grocery store and they can't find one item they need and it's like, I am never shopping here ever again. It's like, whoa, right? Whoa, whoa. What have our lives become? More and more convenience, I think, has amplified our expectations in such a way that when we think things are, or, or when things even are just like 10 times better than they used to be, but all of a sudden it becomes, oh, they're only nine times better now, then we just throw our arms up in complaints. It's really not good. Now, for the examples that we brought up, maybe those are not quite the complaints that we personally have. Maybe they are, I don't know. But maybe they're not, you know, the exact things that we have in our minds. But that doesn't mean that our own complaints are, are free from being irrational, right? Like maybe, maybe we got our hymn books out and we're like, oh, they didn't choose my, my favorite hymn today. What is going on? Like, is hymn time about giving you the opportunity to choose what to praise God with? Yes. It's, it's not just about choosing what will be satisfactory to you. Now, hopefully there's both things in there, right? Hopefully both of those things happen. But if both don't, it's still, right, about praising God. Not getting upset because you feel you wanted to praise him with a different song. Or maybe it's in the message, right? I didn't receive anything from that. Well, did you glorify God in your heart? Or did you just sit there wallowing in self-pity? Now, it is a different story if the preacher is teaching questionable doctrine or, or sharing full-on heresy, right? There are legitimate times for complaints. Jesus did not stay quiet in his father's house, the temple, when they were treating it as a den of robbers, right? He didn't stay quiet. But there's a difference between an actual heart for God and a heart for self. Maybe we've heard, you know, in, in, the, in the message, a similar truth over and over. We know this stuff. Why is he preaching on that again? I mean, hopefully we hear, like, the gospel as an example. Hopefully we hear that constantly in, in some way in a message, somewhere, right? But even if that's the case, it's like, well, praise God again for those truths. Praise God again, even if you know them. I'm sure in our minds we can think of our own complaints, that are irrational, you know, if we really thought about it. Oh, you know, maybe we'll even notice one day when we're complaining about something and we'll think, hmm, you know what? Maybe that isn't something to really complain about, right? And usually our complaining hinders us more than what we're even complaining about, right? We, we've really got to be better. We've really got to be better. We don't want to be like the Israelites that we just read about. It says, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And that is kind of like the cause for complaint a lot of the time, impatience, right? Even when, you know, maybe we're not in a rush and you think, maybe we get caught up in a long line of, you know, vehicles because there's construction. This is where I have struggles with complaints, right? Uh, we become, we, we can become so easily impatient and we, again, including myself, can complain so fast about these things. Like, for me, it's like, I'm not a fan of driving personally, but sometimes when I think about it and when I was writing this, I could just imagine, you know, thinking about, oh, here I am complaining during the drive and imagine hearing like someone from the 1800s like, oh yeah, why don't you, why don't you know, try traveling with my horse and buggy, right? It's just like, hmm. And, and then we get here to our passage today in a text about ancient Israel, and they're walking. They're walking. And the nation of Edom did not grant them passage. That's why they have to go around the nation of Edom. And so that's just a whole other thing. I, I feel their impatience here. Like, I feel it. Moses' sister, Miriam, she had died earlier. Um, his brother, Aaron, had, had died while on the journey around Edom as well. For 
people over 20 years old at the time of the the spies, it was actually kind of hopeless for them too because they weren't going to enter the promised land anyway. They rejected God's command to take the land earlier, even after being witness to like this amazing miracle. God saved them at the Red Sea. He crushed their enemy Egypt, sorry. And so for their lack of faith, when they actually got to the promised land and wouldn't take it over, for their lack of faith, they weren't going to actually ever get into the promised land. It was only people 20 years and younger. So this was a journey, really, for their children to benefit from at that point. Plus, they were eating the same food day after day after day. Same food. Manna is what they were eating. And, of course, when you eat a lot of the same food, you can, of course, get tired of it. Like, I remember the last time I went to the top of Fisher Peak... And I had in my backpack a whole bunch, I think it was two or three boxes of Cliff Bars. You know those kind of energy bar things? They were on sale, so I bought a bunch of them. And I liked them. I did really like them. But after eating all of that, to this day, four and a half years later, I don't think I'll ever eat a Cliff Bar ever again. I just, like, they just do not appeal to me anymore. But it's interesting because sometimes we look at Israel and all their complaining and all this stuff and we, you know, we look and we're like, wow, they're so bad, you know, but it's, it's, it would be different to be there, right? Like, how would we be in that situation? Would we not be in the same boat? You know, complaining about, oh, it's the same thing over and over. Complaining about, oh, we have to go around Edom. What is going on? It says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. That actually shows that there is food, right? There's food. There's no food and water, but there's this worthless food, right? They don't like it. They hate it. And so from a, few, from a, uh, sorry, a human perspective, I do understand this. A lot of them actually even are going to die in the wilderness again. But when we look a little closer at this verse, it's not just that they're complaining, right? That's not the only thing that's going on here. It's not just complaining. They're actually also calling God into question like they did before. Uh, They're basically doing what they did in order to get them the punishment of death in the wilderness anyway, Again, they had right, seen the Red Sea part. Uh, they had even seen the plagues of Egypt. They knew God was a powerful God who would fight for them. And still they revile him. They revile him over him providing food and water for them. But, oh, it, just, it has to be something else, right? It has to be, ah, oh, we want something else, right? They had food. And I know it's easy from our perspective to think, yeah, I mean, it was the same food. We can complain. But they had food. They were provided for It also seems, by saying this uh, bit about having them die in the wilderness, why do they bring us out just to die in the wilderness, that they're also saying, God is not going to see us through as a people. Because I I guess a lot of them knew that they weren't going to make it. But as a people, it's almost just like God is not going to bring our young ones into the promised land. God brought us out of Egypt just maybe as a sick joke to kill us. All of us. God has abandoned us. That's the sentiment here. So it even drives something worse into what their complaint is. And again, um, for that very similar reason, he banned so many of them from ever entering the promised land. And so there was a punishment there. And now we're going to see another one, right? The fiery snakes. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Now, they're called fiery snakes. Uh, That's not because they're on fire. I mean, there are some very supernatural things in the Bible, but uh, here it's not like flaming snakes. It might be fiery snakes because of their color. That might be why they're called fiery snakes, just because they maybe are red and orange or something like that, right? Or it might also be because their venom caused you to feel like this really painful sensation, and so they called it fiery. And that would be what I lean towards, actually. It could be both as well, right? But uh, either way, their venom was deadly, and a lot of people died, and so the Israelites then realized, oh, well, uh, we know why this is happening. And so kudos to them. They actually do repent. It's kind of like 
how our lives are. You know, we sin and we realize it. And so we go before God in repentance. And then sometime later, we do the exact same sin. It's like we don't learn from our past mistakes. But then again, we go to God. We say, here I am again, Lord. I have sinned against you. And is the Lord's grace ever abundant to cover such a multitude of sins, even when we keep going for it? It's just amazing how his mercy and his grace are are so abundant. We see that here too, right? And the people came to Moses. they, They repent. They said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And so again, God is gracious in giving relief, in giving salvation, saving to an undeserving people. Moses, he got together some some copper stuff. Again, maybe it was brass. Here it says bronze. It probably was bronze, uh, like we have in this English translation. But either way, those are both copper type of things. And so what he does with it is he fashions it into this, you know, image of a snake, right? The fiery serpents uh, that were biting people. He fashions it into that image, raises it up on a pole, raises it up, right? And then, of course, the miracle is when those who have been bitten look upon it, the venom stops harming them, and they're healed. Now, the most popular verse in our day, at least, unless it's Genesis 1-1, that might be the most popular verse. But the other most popular verse is John 3.16, right? Most of us probably know that that verse is something that comes up during Jesus' discussion with a specific Pharisee, one who is actually open to talking to Jesus and hearing him out about certain things. His name was Nicodemus. But in that conversation, what else is there? Like, if you think of the conversation of Nicodemus, what else do you think of? You know, because this is where Jesus talks about being born again, right? Being more specifically born of the Spirit. Nicodemus, he seems a little confused about a bunch of things. But then Jesus shares with him something. And as a Pharisee, is something that he would know that would help him picture you know, this saving a little bit, this born again, born of the spirit thing, a little bit better because he would know about the books of the law, numbers very well. It's this story that Jesus points to, John three fourteen, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. And so there you go, right? Jesus relates the serpent being lifted up to what he himself has to do, right? Be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then immediately, right, you have that famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Actually, it's a little different on there, but it's the same thing, right? The story is right there, right in front of that most famous of verses, The bronze serpent story is mentioned right there. That's how closely it's tied to our saving. Tied to the Son of God coming down to save us. So, if that's the case, why is this at all a serpent? Like, why that? Why is Jesus being related to a serpent? Because serpents have a bad history, don't they? Like, we get confirmation in Revelation about who the tempting serpent in the Garden of Eden was. It says, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before God. Salvation does not come through that serpent, right? It comes because of that serpent's defeat. We also, we get our first glimpse 
of what Christ will come and do way back in Genesis 3.15, where God says to the serpent Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. It's again, it's something that's talking about Jesus versus Satan. Jesus is against the serpent. Jesus will get his heel bruised, as in that, that's pretty much the cross right there. He will bruise you. He will do something. He's not going to get away totally, or you're not going to get away totally unscathed. But again, the serpent is going to take the actual crushing on the head, the bruise to the head, the headshot, right? He faces defeat at the hands of Jesus, both at the cross and again, even in our future when he is defeated for good. The majority of time, the majority of the time we see anything in the Bible that has anything to do with serpents, it's about doing evil. Right? In Psalm 58, David says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. They have venom like the venom of a serpent, like the deaf adder that stops its ear. It's the characteristic of the wicked to be associated with the serpent. The Pharisees, enemies of the Christ, right? They're called serpents by Jesus. In Matthew 23, he says, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? So snakes, serpents, are almost always a very negative thing. In fact, because of Satan, serpents themselves, I think, are cursed. So right before God talks about the specific serpent, Satan, uh, when he says, you know, you know, uh, your offspring will be against her offspring. God also seems to speak more generally about serpents. Like right before that, in Genesis 3.14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you, not just, it's, this is what it, why it seems like that, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And so, I mean, you know, if we read on, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life, you know, maybe it's something you could say, oh, well, it's Satan falling from heaven and coming down to the dust of the earth or something like that. I don't know if you wanted to interpret it like that. But because it says all livestock and all beasts of the field, it actually seems like it's more general. Speaking of all snakes, right? All snakes. So cursed, right? Above all beasts of the field, above all livestock. It makes it seem like there's this essence about serpents that is this essence of being something cursed. There is this relation between serpents and curse. Serpents and curses. But the story of the bronze serpent, in that story, are the people actually saved by the serpent itself? No, they're saved by God himself because they looked upon the serpent that was provided. What we see is that the work of the fiery serpents that were biting people, which actually, that was also God's work in a way, right? Because he sent those serpents over there. But still, the work of the fiery serpents that God had sent, God then, because he doesn't back those serpents anymore, instead he backs this, this bronze serpent, God then thwarts the work of the fiery serpents. He uses a serpent to thwart the works of the serpent. He uses a serpent to defeat the work of a serpent, of the serpents, right? And this is actually not the first time that God has used a serpent against other serpents. It's not. Back in Egypt, standing before Pharaoh, Moses' brother Aaron threw down his staff and it became a serpent. The staff turned into a serpent. Pharaoh's magicians actually did the same thing. They threw down their staffs and they also became serpents. But then what happened? God's serpents, or God's serpents, sorry, eats all of the magician's serpents. So when it comes to serpent versus serpent, of course, the serpent that God is behind wins easily, wins easily. And that was actually probably the very same staff, the one that Aaron had that turned into a serpent, that was probably the very same staff that ended up in the Ark of the Covenant. So this thing that's in the Ark of the Covenant, or that was in the Ark of the Covenant, it, it's like amazing to me. Like It means it was something holy, right? This ends up in the holiest of artifacts. And so 
You know, usually we think of right because of what we talked about. Serpents come with this correlation of being cursed. But it isn't always like that. Sure, God can use bad people for bad things and bad stuff for, or sorry, bad people for good things, bad stuff for, to do good, right? You think of Cyrus, who was not a believer, who was not a God-fearing person, and he sends Israel back to uh, rebuild Jerusalem. God can use something bad for something good. But this time, this staff that became a serpent was a holy item, right? That was allowed to be in the holiest of artifacts. And so it's interesting. And with that, we come to this conclusion. Not all snake things are bad. In fact, there's this quality about them that's encouraged about snakes, right? Matthew 10, 16, Jesus says, be wise as serpents or be shrewd as serpents. Not all snake things are are bad. There was nothing wrong with, with the bronze serpent itself. In fact, if we're thinking about serpents and curses, do you know what was more cursed than the bronze serpent itself? Something that hangs on a tree. Exactly. The Messiah. Jesus was. Galatians 3.13 says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What was the curse of the law? In the most basic form, it was basically you disobey, you die. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. The curse of the cross is Jesus. Jesus himself. Now this saying comes from a law at the end of Deuteronomy 21. And it's actually part of why the Jewish leaders don't uh, leave Jesus' body on the cross for very long after he died. It says, and if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree... His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day. For a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. A hanged man is cursed by God. Cursed is anyone who's hanged on a tree. It's interesting how when God does something, he can have so many different things in mind. Right? He gives the Israelites this law so that they're not like other nations. Right? They don't need to display people's bodies on trees. They don't need to let them rot like other nations might do. And I'm sure there's cleanliness in mind for this, right? as cleanliness was a, a huge part of the Mosaic law. Keep our places clean, cleanse yourselves, all these sorts of things. Um, and maybe there were lots of things that needed to be addressed. Maybe this was a problem in Israel. Maybe this was something they were doing and God comes in and he's like, you will not be like that anymore or something like that. Either way, he gives this law for a purpose for Israel in that time. But at the same time, God is placing this in his law to foreshadow Jesus. It's got more than one purpose. God's got more than one thing in mind when this happens. Because who hangs on a tree? Those who have committed a crime punishable by death. I don't know if you've ever asked the question, you know, why was it specifically crucifixion that was picked for Jesus? Uh, why was that why he died? Because we know he had to die. Why was it crucifixion? And maybe something that you thought was, oh, well, because it's, you know, one of the most physically painful things someone can go through. You know, maybe it's something that shows God's love for us so much because, I mean, what can show your love more than being crucified for someone, right? I think that's part of it. But also, it is to fulfill Scripture. Amen. It is to fulfill Scripture. First, it fulfills the event that we talked about that was foreshadowed by the bronze serpent. There's actually this amazing scene in the Gospel of John where a voice from heaven replies to Jesus' Father, glorify your name, by saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And people hear this audible voice saying that from the heavens. And then Jesus, afterward, tells the crowd of people that heard it, this voice 
has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, which is serpent Satan, right? Cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Not necessarily every single person ever, but all people, as in all people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, But then John gives us the reason why he's saying these things, why he said specifically, lifted up from the earth. It says he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So he's not just going to be lifted up like, oh, we exalt you. And he's not just going to be lifted up like, oh, he ascends to heaven after he's risen from the dead, because that's what he does. This is specifically talking about like lifted up from the earth. It's specifically talking about um, his death on the cross, being lifted up on the cross what death he was going to die. That's what it meant back when he was talking to Nicodemus. That's what it meant when he was talking to this crowd that heard that voice from heaven. Secondly, the second thing it fulfills is, of course, this uh, substitution, this uh, substitutionary aspect of the atonement, which is Christ making up for our sins by becoming the curse himself, by receiving what the people who committed crimes punishable by death received, which again was death. It was hanging on the tree, right? It's clear in Romans that we are all sinners in the eyes of God. We all all fall short of his standard, of his glory, right? We fall short of being allowed to partake in his everlasting paradise, in his everlasting glory, his kingdom. It's also clear in Romans that the wages of sin is death. We have to pay for our sin by our death, by dying, Right? The penalty is death, and yet there's been made a way that we don't have to die eternally. Right, Jesus becomes the curse in our place. He dies the criminal death for us. So that's the other way that it's um, right, fulfilled uh, from the Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, the sin offering, who knew no sin, because Jesus was perfect, he was sinless, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. Jesus became the sin offering. He became cursed. God Almighty came down from heaven and became cursed for us. His body was brutally broken. His blood was viciously shed. The weight of all of our sin was upon him so that anyone who looks on him, and of course we didn't need to be standing there at the cross looking at him. We look from, you know, without physically seeing him, we look from our future, we look to the past to see Jesus. Whoever looks upon him in faith, right, a genuine repentant faith in his lordship, death, and resurrection will be saved from something far worse than just a a snake bite, a venomous snake bite. They'll be saved from the consequence of sin, the everlasting death. They'll be saved from hell. And it's not only that, right? The rock of ages brings a double cure. It's not just saved from wrath. No, it's also made pure. In Christ, what do we become, right? What do we become? Not a, a righteousness that is our own, No, our righteousness, on our own, it's filthy rags. It's filthy. That's the best it is. Gross, filthy rags. No, we become the righteousness of God. Think about that. The most righteous person, the most righteous being, the most perfect, amazing being there is. We become his righteousness. That's amazing. That's how we're judged now. And if that's how we're judged, clothed in the pure vestments of God's righteousness, the vestments of Christ who took our place, who took the death of a criminal, then we meet the requirements and are allowed into heaven after we die to be with our Savior forever. So, in Christ... What do we really have to complain about? Very, 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 very few things, right? The God of the universe is bringing us to life eternal after this. But, of course, still on the earth, we do have things that are 
legitimate earthly problems. What do we do with those? How do we deal with them? Where do we bring them to? You see, the saving serpent is, again, only the saving serpent because of the saving God behind it. The bronze serpent itself is nothing. The Israelites even try to worship it way down the line until King Hezekiah's day. 2 Kings 18 verse 4 tells us that he removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. They used to worship the serpent rather than the God behind it. We live in a, a world of complaints. We live in a very self-driven world. I know we can find things that work for us that uh, seem like they're the answer, and uh, we give them praise and we give them worship. But again, who's really behind it all? Behind the, let's say, medicine that works for you, or the good doctor who actually treats you and and you heal. Behind them is the Lord who provides. Behind the safe arrival to every destination is the Lord who's at work. That doesn't mean you can't thank the doctor or thank the pilot or the driver, right? That doesn't mean you can't attribute certain things to them. But the one you truly praise, the only one you actually worship, The one you give the greatest of thanks to is, of course, the Lord God Almighty. He is why you can have joy. He has rescued you through his death. He has loved you with a love that is so unconditional that he would even come down and be crucified. And he works even in the small details. Even in the small details. So let's try and remember that. As we move into communion together, we can surely think of those little things that he's done in our lives. But again, at the same time, let's also not forget the biggest reason why we can praise him. The biggest reason why we can take joy in him day by day, even in the little things. And that is the most important thing ever done. Right, The thing that all the scriptures point to from telling the serpent his head would be crushed all the way back in Genesis 3 and the heel would be bit or the heel would be bruised, I should say, to the provision of a a substitutionary sacrifice on behalf of Isaac. We didn't actually talk about that right now or today, um, but Abraham didn't have to sacrifice Isaac because there was a substitute. We can think of the Passover lambs being slain in Egypt for the protection from the angel of death. And then back to things that we were talking about, right? We think of the criminals who were hanged from a tree under the Mosaic law. We think of this story of the bronze serpent, how it was raised up to save people. And another thing too, we can even think of, you know, like Jonah being swallowed by the great fish. Even that is a foreshadowing of Jesus' death. And there's so much more. There's so much more. The Messiah must Suffer. The Messiah must die. The heel, again, must be bruised. Hebrews 2 says, For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation, or sorry, should make, yeah, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children of, or I and the children God has given me. I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death. 
that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Let us receive today the bread that represents his human body that grew for over 30 years but was ultimately broken through the scourging, through beating, through the thorned crown, and through crucifixion. Let us receive today the juice that represents his perfect blood that is sufficient to cover all of our sins, past, present, and future. Let us also remember the defeat, the crushing of the head of the serpent Satan at the cross. And let us remember the shackles being removed from us, keeping us in our bondage to sin. Those have been removed. We are free because of his body that was broken, because of his blood that was shed. If I could call up uh, Rick and Jerry to come help me hand out um, the elements here. One of you can hand out the, uh, the crackers that represent his body. One of them, or one of you can hand out the juice. And uh, yeah, you can go and pass them out right away. And, and, and as we pass this out, remember that if your heart is not right before God, if you haven't actually received him, having surrendered to his lordship with a genuine faith in his death and resurrection, then it's okay to just let the tray and the basket pass by. This is again for those who know him. And we do this in remembrance of the death for our sins and the resurrection that has saved us. And so while those are being handed out, uh, I want to read for you what it says in the prophecy actually about Jesus' triumphal entry because the prophecy actually goes further than just that. You know, there's the triumphal entry that comes in and then it goes straight further to his death. Zechariah 9, verses 9 to 12 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nation. So this isn't just about the Jews' salvation. It's going to be for the salvation of the whole world, right? The nations other than Jerusalem, or other than the Jews, other than Israel, the nations are all included. They're all included. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today, I declare that I will restore to you double. The blood of my covenant, God says, because of that blood, he will set free the prisoners from the waterless pit. The pit that has no water, the pit that then has no life, really. So let us in reverence celebrate the perfect sacrifice, broken body, <coughs> shed blood, that brings peace to the nations, that brings salvation from Zion. I will uh, read our scripture. I will pray. And then when you see me partake, actually take the bread and drink of the cup, that's when you also Partake. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. Lord, thank you so much again for your body that was broken for us. 
that you were willing to go to the cross for, for sinners. Thank you so much that you loved us enough to give us a, a substitute. We were the ones who had sinned, and that was punishable by death. We know that from Romans. The wages of sin is death. And yet you were the one who ended up becoming the cursed person hanging on a tree. God Almighty, the holiest of holies, becoming a curse for us. It's amazing what you have done. It's amazing, amazing, amazing what you've done. And I just pray in this time that we would be focused on you, that we would remember that, and that we would be praising you in our hearts as we partake of this. In the name of Jesus, amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup. Lord, thank you so much for your blood that was shed on our behalf. You are so good. And it's, it's not just your love for us that's so good, but it's also your power. And I always love thinking about your power when it comes to your blood. There is power in the blood, power that is sufficient to cover all of our sins, past, present, and future. Thank you, Lord, that it's sufficient to save and you've got us clenched safe in the cleft of the rock. You've got us clenched safe in your hands and no one can ever snatch us from your hands, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that your blood covers us in such a way that we can have security in you for good, for eternity, starting at the moment that we really truly placed our our faith in you in your death and resurrection placed under your lordship. Thank you so much for this. And I just pray again that we would be not only remembering this now as we partake of it, the blood that that covers all of our sins, your sacrifice for us, but that we would remember it, of course, from here on out, every single hour, every single minute of our lives. Help us to live in a way that honors your sacrifice and that remembers your sacrifice. You've done so, so, so much for us. And I just pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Apostle Peter says of Jesus, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseers, overseer of your soul.